Okay, just got a sign that we are ready to go. Welcome everybody to the Julian Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory Roundtable or panel actually, which is on COP27. I guess all of you know what that is, but just in case, it stands for Conference of the Parties. And you might wonder what does that actually mean to have a Conference of the Parties? It is, the, in, in the words of a web page, the supreme decision making body of UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now, what is that all about? That came out of the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 and was a response to the increasing signs that climate change might, in the language of UNFCCC, pose dangerous interference with the, with the climate system caused by human activities. So it was actually an outcome, UNFCCC was an outcome of the, the Earth Summit and the first conference of the parties, the first meeting of the decision-making body was in uh, 95, so three years after, in Berlin. That was COP1. COP3 was in Kyoto, and that might ring a bell with many of you. That was where the so-called Kyoto Protocol was uh, conceived, which uh, in a way was, was a was done with all the best intentions, but turned out to not really be enforceable and to get traction. So that was superseded then during COP 21, 2015 in Paris by the well-known Paris Accord or Paris Agreement. And since then, I mean, the, the, the main characteristic of the Paris Agreement is that there are voluntarily voluntarily uh, national determined contributions towards emission cuts and towards measures to keep climate change at a certain level of warming. Warming is used as a, actually a simple way to measure the effect and the impact of uh, climate change. And you all are familiar with the window that was set, less than two degrees global warming, ideally, 1.5 Celsius. That later then was confirmed by the international, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in the 1.5 degrees Celsius report. So what we would like to do here with that background, we would like to have a discussion today about what happened during COP27, which ended about 10 days ago in uh, Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt. And um, just want to reflect upon how far did we get since the Paris Agreement, what were the main outcomes of COP27, and what can we expect moving forward based on the evolution of the negotiations since then. It's a great pleasure to introduce the members of the panel. I'm uh, going from left to right here. We have Elizabeth uh, Quickly, who is uh, studying here at the School of Sustainability, International Development and Sustainability. She also is a uh, sustainability education advocate. Then we have Dan Bodansky, who is a Regents Professor at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law and also a Distinguished Global Future Scholar. Next to Dan is Anne Nielsen. She is the director of the Office of Global Engagement in the Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College. And then to the far left, from my perspective, we have Michael Dorsey, who is the Rob and Melanie Walton Chair of Sustainability Solutions and Professor of Practice in the College of Global Futures. So the way we will do that is we will have some opening statements and then go into a conversation and then into a question and answer period. So with respect to the opening reflections in essence on COP27, I would like to ask Dan about what are your thoughts then about what is typically considered the major outcome of COP27 
the fund for loss and damage. So if you could give give us a bit of read of, you know, how you see that, that would that would be a great start of this conversation. Well, great. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, as Peter said, um, the big news from COP27 was the creation of a fund to uh, address loss and damage um, from uh, for developing countries. So what I wanted to do just briefly is discuss what is loss and damage, uh, a little bit of the history of uh, loss and damage in the climate change negotiations, and then very briefly describe what was decided and what wasn't decided uh, at COP27. So loss and damage uh, fits into really a trilogy of climate change policies. So mitigation is uh, taking steps to uh, avert climate change, uh, primarily by reducing emissions, but also potentially by increasing the amount of carbon dioxide that's taken out of the atmosphere uh, in various ways. Uh, adaptation is then minimizing the impacts uh, of climate change uh, by adapting to it. And then loss and damage is addressing the unavoidable damages caused by climate change. So to the extent we can prevent climate change through mitigation, that's the first step. Uh, secondly, to adapt to climate change to minimize the damage, but then loss and damages, uh, the damages that are unavoidable. And this can be due to either extreme weather events like hurricanes uh, or by slow onset events like sea level rise or the melting of glaciers. So uh, loss and damage in the climate change regime, I, I describe it as a slow onset event because it's like a slow tide rising. It's very, very gradual the way it's developed. Uh, it's really been in the negotiations from the very start, but it's taken a very, very long time uh, to develop in the negotiations. So in 2013, an international mechanism, the Warsaw International Mechanism, was established, which was really the first time the climate change regime had addressed loss and damage at all by establishing some institution to uh, discuss it. Uh, then in 2015, loss and damage was included in the Paris Agreement in Article 8, uh, but on the condition that it was not a basis for liability and compensation. This was one of the requirements of the U.S. to agree to include loss and damage as part of the Paris Agreement. Uh, then uh, last year in Glasgow, vulnerable countries proposed establishing a finance facility to address loss and damage, but it wasn't accepted by developed countries. Uh, they decided to establish a two-year process to discuss finance, uh, but uh, small island states didn't want to wait two years, so they then brought it up again this year uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh, uh, and that led to the establishment of a fund. So uh, just to review some of the issues relating to the establishment of a fund, this isn't about loss and damage generally, but about the fund itself. There's the, what would it look like? What would financing for loss and damage look like? And there are a variety of options in, in addition to a fund. Uh, it could be done by disaster relief through reform of multilateral development banks or MDBs, uh, through bilateral assistance, through debt deferment. So a lot of different ideas on the table for how you could finance loss and damage. Uh, then there's the why, why address loss and damage. And uh, the thing that was a red line for the US was loss and damage is not uh, due to liability for um, historical emissions. Um, the US doesn't accept that there's any uh, liability uh, that it has incurred as a result of its emissions. Then there's the for what, what are you spending the money for? Planning, immediate relief, economic development after harm has occurred. There's the for whom, which countries should be getting finance for uh, loss and damage. Is it all developing countries? Is it just vulnerable to developing countries? The by whom, who's giving the money? Uh, developed countries, other countries, other actors, innovative sources of funding like a tax on maritime transport or aviation. Um, how are you developing the fund? Uh, you know, uh, what's the process? And uh, the initial process was the Glasgow Dialogue started a year ago, which was a two-year process, but then uh, what interim steps might be taken? And then when are you doing it? Um, are we doing it next year, establishing the fund, uh, the year after? Uh, developed countries said two years is when we should be aiming for, and developing countries, and particularly small island states, said no, needs to be done now. Uh, so how is this addressed then in the COP27 decision? Really, the decision was largely a framework. Uh, it left a lot of issues open. Uh, so it's been often misreported, I think, in the papers uh, about what it actually was decided. So the thing that was decided actually before the, at the very outset, of the COP at the very outset as a condition for including this even on the agenda of uh, the COP27 was that it was not aiming at liability or compensation. That was a US requirement to even include the issue on the agenda. So the uh, decision to establish a fund is not on the basis of there being liability, uh, having to compensate, 
uh, it's uh, the reasons are left unspecified um, as to why it's being created. So in terms of the what, um, the fund was the headline, but the fund is part of what some refer to as a mosaic of approaches. So there are a lot of different approaches that are mentioned in the decision in addition to the fund. Um, so the fund is sort of one among many ways that finance could be provided. It could also be provided through MDBs, multilateral development banks, debt deferment, or these other techniques. Um, for what uh, decisions completely silent on that, that's something still to be worked out, what the money would be going for, uh, by who, uh, for whom, uh, EU, US said it should be for vulnerable countries, uh, developing countries said no, all developing countries should be eligible. So it's a little bit of a fudge, it's developing countries generally, but particularly vulnerable states. So with a focus on vulnerable states as being the recipients of funding. Uh, by whom is completely unspecified. So there's not any agreement as to whether developed countries will be providing it, other countries. Um, it contemplating broadening the donor base beyond developed countries, but leaves it to be determined uh, in the future. Um, how is all this going to be worked out? The transition committee was established, which has a one year deadline to work out these issues. Uh, and then they're supposed to come back with proposals for adoption next year uh, in Dubai at COP28. Uh, and then finally on the when, uh, the fund was established now at COP27, but the transitional committee will be working out the details. All of these questions as for what, uh, for whom, by whom, and so forth, uh, still to be determined over the next year. Very, very fast timeline uh, because the transitional committee is supposed to wrap up its work by next year. So that's a brief overview of uh, the loss and damage fund. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Dane. Um, I would like to turn to Ayn. And there was quite a bit of uh, discussion around education during this COP, but also it will be a, a pillar of COP28 coming up in the Emirates uh, next year. So what, how do you see the role of education right now? And how, will it, how, how do you see it evolve? In the future, which role does it really play in the in the COP process? And education, of course, uh, going from um, you know formal education, but also educating people who are negotiating, parliamentarians, etc. Thank you. Um, I'd take us back first to COP twenty seven or twenty six in Glasgow, which was actually the first time that at the COP convening, education ministers were invited to come and um, education targets were set by many countries, not all, but this is, kind of gives you a context. It wasn't until the 26th COP that education was even brought to the table and education ministers were even beginning to think about these in the context of their educational systems. So fast forward to this year at COP27, uh, we saw a much greater presence of youth, thankfully at the conference. Um, I have a quick photo here of the, uh, Youth and Climate Hub, which you, you can just see from the action in the photo, it was like this constantly. So the, the power and the, the force of the youth at COP27, I would say, was, was much greater than I had seen last year at COP26. I will say that was my first COP, so I'm not an expert in the COP convening. But to get back to your question, um, I think that the discussion of education is just beginning and how we educate our communities, how we educate our schools, um, how we infuse this in our curriculum. The youth are quite strong and quite clear in their messaging about reimagining education. They do not see education serving the, the purposes for them to survive on this planet. Most of the youth that I encountered at the conference talked about how they had found climate education on their own. It wasn't something that was taught to them in schools. It was something that they had noticed in their communities um, in their environment and sought out the information. And they are moving at a much faster pace than I would say even the educational systems are. Currently in the United States, just to give us context here, New Jersey is the only state in the United States that has climate standards at the K-12 level. California is apparently bringing them on soon, but what does that say for our educational systems? The other concern we have in education is that this will be siloed into maybe a, you know, a subset of STEM or into the sciences where um, for us really to make the changes in education, we need to in, infuse climate education across the curriculum. This is something that came up from the youth over and over. And one of the things they brought out, um, for example, to your um, question about communities in many languages, climate 
crisis, climate education is not translated. Uh, Mitzi Janelle, one of the climate activists from the Philippines talked about in, in Philippine language that uh, climate change translated to warm weather. And how do, you, how do you build an educational curriculum around warm weather? How do you talk about that in the community? So there's gonna be, I think, a massive influx of educators next year at COP28. The discussion has already begun. I know we're already planning in the teacher's college for some of the work we want to bring forward at COP28 and, continue, and starting to engage with um, other schools of education, other programs to see how we can continue to garner the force. Great, thank you. Uh, and staying on that uh, topic and looking at all the, the young people who were there, Elizabeth, you, you watched from afar, but we, we had that sense there where we got, uh, you know, there were voices who said it was at the, the tale of two cops, where there was a lot of movement, a lot of enthusiasm, especially from the younger uh, participants. And then there was the negotiation part that many felt as, you know, much less uh, positive and, and, and enthusiastic. So from, from your perspective, what was your experience from watching this uh, from, from afar? And uh, what, what does it mean, what, what you observed? In your view, what does that mean for future leadership of, let's say, the youth movement and uh, students like yourself around the globe? Thank you. I would say from my perspective, being here at ASU um, while COP27 was happening, it was very interesting to just see the information barriers regarding the Conference of the Parties and climate. As, as a sustainability student, I had a couple of professors bring it up. Um, I personally was engaged in the efforts and was able to see what ASU was doing, but I was taking that decision to pursue finding more information about COP myself in terms of information available to general youth that through the social media, a lot of youth platforms focused on climate action were being incredibly active of trying to share information, trying to update the youth around the world about what is happening at COP currently, what are the negotiations, breaking it down to a more understandable level as well. But it was also just interesting to observe that this is my perspective and um, probably the perspective of many youth passionate already about climate change. But for the general public, I think it probably passed over their heads even here. Um, the communication, just from a general level, if you're not seeking it, it was hard to see that it was happening. Thank you, and we will we'll get back uh, to that uh, later. So le let's go back to the loss and damage fund. And uh, Michael, you are actually engaged since quite a while in uh, climate and energy financing and, and issues related to that. So from your perspective, what will the establishment of that fund do in the overall um, you know, landscape of dealing with climate change? Uh, is it a net positive? Of course, it, it is a great outcome that this has been established, but might there be unintended consequences for other actions that are drawing from the same resources? Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great way to sort of frame it. I mean, for me, uh, I would say largely the loss and damage fund is symbolically important. Uh, and it's really nice, the history that Dan laid out. Uh, I think we have to put it in the context of the other standing fund, which is the, the Green Climate Fund or the GCF, uh, which is really uh, the antecedent uh, to uh, the negotiations and the discussions around creating the, the loss of damage fund in the first place. And, and the, the big problem there we have is that that fund has been, you know, wholly and woefully undercapitalized. Uh, it's had a similar uh, target of 100 billion a year, it's never been within, uh, you know, barely uh, just in one year, about 10% of that. Uh, so it's usually run underneath uh, 10, 10 billion a year in, in money's end um, since they assembled it, um, you know, actually before Paris, really in, in Copenhagen, and then turned it on in, in Cancun. Uh, so over a decade of underfunding. So that's really, I think, a bad signal for going forward. Uh, you know, it, it's certainly symbolically important to have uh, these new. Uh, the, the creation of a new fund, but if we look at the history of moving resources, and the GCF is largely created to tackle that mitigation and adaptation uh, space that Dan, you know, outlined, uh, and it hasn't done that. And you know, to put it in perspective, depending on you know whose numbers you believe, um, you know, we're looking at you know, somewhere around uh, 
a trillion to 10 trillion a, a, a year in damages, um, you know, depending on whose data you look at. Um, if you just look at, forget about the new fund, um, just look at the undercapitalized uh, GCF of its high watermark of 10 billion, which has only gotten there once. Um, you know, that's somewhere between, uh, you know, uh, a tenth uh, or a hundredth of what's really needed to tackle these problems. Uh, and those billions and trillions of dollars uh, don't mean much, but let's put it in the perspective of your house uh, after a catastrophic event. If you had a $50,000 hit on your house or your car was wiped out and some human came along and gave you $50, you might want to grab them by the throat to fight them or walk away from them on a good day. Uh, that's roughly those percentages. Uh, you might, on the high end of that, uh, the 10th percent, you might get $500. Uh, so you might sort of, you know, shirk and grin and walk away. But putting it in that context uh, with a $50,000 hit on your sales individually, that should sort of give you some empathy of why, you know, small countries, poor countries get very, very mad in these negotiations, get really vehement. Uh, talk about, you know, these targets are really recipe for suicide. Um, you, 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 can, you don't get that in the, in the headline, but when you put that in sort of, you know, personal numbers, you can see why people would be quite outraged. Many countries have seen, you know, north of 70, 80% of GDP wiped out from catastrophic weather events um, with no monies at all moving their way. And that high watermark, uh, that 10 billion or so that, that did go into GCF was done in sort of uh, fly by night, not dark of the night when Obama left office, he pushed about 4 billion. Uh, in the dark of the night to the fund that, that got it to that $10 billion mark that year. So it, it's helpful. Uh, it's a good signal. Um, but will we get there? Uh, history says probably not uh, in terms of the state coming in to, to deal with and, and capitalize and fully uh, you know, stand up a loss and damage fund. Um, but that, I think that points us to the road forward you know, towards Dubai and going forward of what we sort of need to do uh, you know, at the level of humanity, at the scale of you know, the multilateral system uh, to move resources in that regard. Thanks, Michael. On that uh, note, uh, Dan, you, you have been part of negotiations since a long time, and you saw the uh, um, temperature window being set at, at Paris, and you, you saw what has happened since then. Looking from the outside, one and, and looking at data, actually, not just from the outside, one can have the impression that we are moving deeper and deeper into what, what is often called the emissions gap um, or the emissions commitment gap. Uh, and right now, we are, we are actually on a trajectory for global warming to maybe 2.6, 2.8, 2.7 uh, degrees Celsius. So, you know, approaching double what 1.5 would be. From a perspective of watching the negotiations, I, I would have to assume from my perspective that this is recognized, but being part of it, how, how do you see the lack of responsiveness to these very obvious trends of deviating more and more from the original target? So, I think it all depends on sort of what one's reference point is. Um, when Paris was negotiated in 2014, 2015, uh, I think the projections were global warming of about four degrees, uh, somewhere uh, various um, uh, range of, of temperature increases, but somewhere between three and six degrees, but four was sort of the, the um, uh, dominant pathway. So uh, coming down to uh, two and a half degrees, not nearly enough, not where we need to get, but still a significant improvement. One of the things that was interesting in the last uh, six assessment report of the IPCC was every tenth of a degree you uh, reduce uh, uh, global warming makes a big difference uh, to the world. So coming down from four to two and a half, not enough, but still I think we need to at least recognize that there's been some progress. Some of the um, emissions pathways that were the dominant ones four or five years ago now, we're clearly on a much, much better emissions pathway than we were. So I think uh, to say that the gap is increased, I, I, I don't think is, that's not the way I would see it at least. I think there's still a big gap. The difficulty of getting to 1.5 is getting greater and greater because the further down you go, the less you have left that you can emit. Um, but we're still coming down significantly from what the emissions projections looked like a few years ago. So I, I don't think, um, I mean, I think the problem uh, with climate change generally is it's driven largely by domestic politics. So you can agree to whatever you want to agree to internationally, but the fact of the matter is 
uh, you're faced with in the US, US Congress, you're faced with huge issues in China, India, other major emitters in terms of how much they can reduce emissions. So I think there is a recognition uh, in the negotiations that we need, uh, countries need to step up their effort. One of the things that was agreed to in Glasgow last year was the countries were supposed to come back and revisit their nationally determined contributions this year. And if they're not aligned with a 1.5 degree pathway to revise their NDCs, and a few countries did, but not very many, uh, there are huge challenges internationally, the war in Ukraine, uh, finance, uh, um, uh, inflation and so forth, that's made it even more difficult for countries to commit to more. So um, I think there is a recognition the Paris, that we need to do more. The Paris Agreement is built to try to uh, build in a ratchet mechanism where each successive cycle of NDCs, the NDCs are supposed to get more, uh, more ambitious, but actually implementing that I think is extremely difficult politically. So I, I take your point that some people thought four degrees would be the, the main uh, pathway of, of warming. But for, for many of us uh, who, who looked at, at climate uh, fairly carefully, that, that was actually a little bit an, an upper limit. I mean, the, the six and even eight were, were really extreme cases that, that nobody really thought, you know, I mean, if we would go there, just forget it. I mean, <laughs> the lights are out. Uh, so if you then look at that from the perspective of what we see, we are now at 1.1, 1.2, and we are actually seeing more and more of the effects playing out. And we get also a better feeling of what 1.5 to 2.5 would be in light of that, you know, we really, sh I think, can forget about the four, that that would be absolute catastrophe. Even two looks like a major hit to the earth system and to the way we can live on the planet. So th having that in mind, Elizabeth, you know, looking now from a perspective of the younger generation, you have you know, many decades uh, ahead of you, many more than some of us here on the panel have, um, you see that playing out, you see the slowness, and, and I, I, do, I do understand what, what Dan is saying, nevertheless, it is a slow reaction to what has been set uh, as targets at Paris. How, how does the young generation feel about that? Um, you know, that, that slow response to the targets that were agreed upon? Uh, I completely agree with Dan, like there has been progress, but at the same time, it's not enough. We are already seeing effects of climate change across the world. We will be seeing more in the future. And as you mentioned, Peter, seeing at COP, all the energy, it's tail to COPs. There's a ton of energy and youth, a ton of action, a ton of youth NGOs. We have Youngo, which is the largest um, youth climate organization in the world with over 10,000 members. There's a lot of energy in youth to see climate action happen but you're not seeing that same energy in the actual rooms that have these discussions, create these policies. And we've discussed with the funds, with funds for loss and damage, um, all of these, the Paris Agreement, having NDCs, all of this, there's no actual enforceability or accountability methods at stake. So you have these people higher up, like from the youth perspective, we're seeing people in positions of power, creating these decisions, creating these contributions, making these deals that they have proven they won't hold themselves accountable to. And then you have at the youth area where we're trying our hardest to like put our perspectives out there, advocate for our futures, advocate for the futures of those who don't have a voice to share, um, don't have access to these spaces. So it, it has been kind of a complicated space of youth having a ton of energy and wanting to see a better future. But even if we feel like we're being heard, not seeing actual action come from that. Just uh, extend on that a, a little bit. And that is the, the youth movement around climate was probably the largest movement uh, on a global scale that was created in the shortest period of time in the youngest segment of the population. And of course, the pandemic you know, put a little bit of a dent into it. But if we forget about the pandemic for a moment and just look at the energy, how do you see this energy being sustained in view of some of the disappointments that necessarily you will experience looking at some of the outcomes, which might have all good reasons, as Dan pointed out, but nevertheless must be disappointing to 
you know your generation to to see the lack of progress so what do you think that this momentum can be sustained long enough to push us onto a different trajectory i think we definitely have to put effort into sustaining it but it can be sustained um a concerning point that hopefully we'll find ways to work through is one of the general discussions with youth climate leaders is how lonely this space is. And that is because there are a lot of youth passionate about these issues, but there are also a lot that aren't. And that comes with accessibility to this information, which one of the key ways that you can really push for um, maintaining and sustaining this movement and youth and this energy is to bring more people on board. When you feel like you're not alone in this community, when you have support, you're more motivated to actually create change because you feel like you have the power to do it, which is why Anne's brought it up before, climate education is just incredibly important and a key factor to sustaining the youth climate movement. Yeah, turning back to, to you, Anne, and on that topic, what role can education, information that is distributed over large segments of the population actually play? how successful has it been in similar situations in the past? And are you optimistic that we actually can educate people at the level that we need in terms of scale, but also speed? Those are big questions. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the discussion for me in education is sadly very familiar of looking for change in education and it's moving slow. It's not progressing at the pace you want it, you want it to change. I mean, when we look at in the realm of education right now, globally, the main predictors of success are your literacy and numeracy rates. That's what we, what we measure. And I'm not saying that those are not important. They're, they're important predictors of um, you know, how a, a community and how a, a area a group you know progresses, sorry. Um, but at the same time, it's not leading to the results we need to see. So I think there needs to be a major push in education. I think it needs to happen at the micro and at the macro level. So it needs to not only be policy and changes in um, the way we structure education, which is something we're looking at within our college at reimagining the education workforce to bring teams of educators around students that hopefully will be climate literate, um, but at also in some of the micro changes just in our day-to-day -day actions. Um, you know, bringing nature forward in our in our curriculum, emphasizing what we're learning from nature, what we what we can learn from indigenous communities, and bringing all of that back into the fold in education. Um, currently, education is pretty Western dominant right now, and there is a huge push to um, break that down, as well as to bring in other ways of knowing, other knowledges. Um, there's information on pedagogies of hope, which speaks to what. Um, Lizzie was talking about, and that is, um, you know, a, a great predictor of motivation and well-being. So there's a lot we can do in education to shift things, to not only educate citizens in our communities, but also to bring it down to the kindergarten preschool level and start there. It's It's got to be top down and bottom up at the same time. Are we beyond the point where the top down actually prevents talking at the right level? and the, the right frequency about climate change? Do you think we have passed that threshold? Because for a long time, climate change was really a polarizing topic to talk about, and it was sometimes prevented to be introduced into curricula for that reason, for political reason. Do you think we are beyond that and we are now fighting with the intrinsic difficulty to get new insights into people's, not just mind in an abstract sense, but also into their, into their action? I hope not, um, but it, it's going to be a political topic regardless, and I think that can't be something that um, keeps us from from addressing these topics in schools. We need to find a way to bring these these topics up in classrooms in ways that bring everybody to the table that's inclusive. I don't think we're there yet, but I think it's something we we can't give up on. I'm like Lizzie. We, um, my hope is still strong. I've I've been an educator for over 20 years, so um, I think I've got that. Intrinsic, intrinsic motivation in me to keep pushing forward. Michael, coming back to, to Dan, and you know, that, that Dan's point is well taken, there is progress. But a lot of 
uh, that is based on the official negotiations. So from your perspective, being in the domain where you know, progress is made by investing, by bringing new technology to market, do you see options to accelerate from that point of view or from that, from that perspective, from that landscape, so that the political action is actually not just supported, but maybe even uh, you know, outpaced by what is happening on the ground? Yeah, I mean, for me, and I think, you know, I'm certainly not in the, the camp of uh, you know, naysaying about the multilateral process and the structure. I think it's a super important benchmark. Um, and I think it sets the sort of the, the framework or, or terms of the debate for not just the political process, but even on the investment side. It's a very strong uh, signal send to markets. Uh, it's a strong signal send to, to governments. Uh, uh, American cacistocratic activity aside, um, you know, so, and I think that process, you know, going forward um, is one that's going to really, um, you know, drive us forward. Right now, we're in a world where the cheapest way to generate energy, as many of you in the room know, is with renewables. Uh, and now that's not exclusively a result of these negotiations, but it has a lot to do uh, with them in, in, the first, in the first place. And I think that that's going to continue to be the case. And we're in a world where not only is it the cheapest way to generate renewable, you know, is, are renewables the cheapest way to generate power? But new technologies are coming on that are going to be and play a big role in you know sort of kicking back and rolling back the unfolding climate crisis. So I think that's absolutely important uh, in the multilateral processes. You know, it's been a good uh, signal sender. Uh, you know, over uh, you know now a couple of decades, uh, in spite of or despite you know the slowness of that process. So, so you uh, you think that the. Um... Just trying to interpret what 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 you say um, that the the private sector actually has the capacity to to push and to implement. Well, I, I think so, but I mean, it certainly you know there's a need for you know increased government involvement and increased you know government support. You know, right now, you know, not just in the U.S. but in many countries, you know, you've got um, backwards, uh, wayward policies on you know just you know driving renewable energy. Uh, you've got, you know, not only do you have backward policies, you've got some places you have no policies. Um, and it's not a problem that's unique to the U.S. But I think that, you know, the private sector is going to you know, continue to seek out things that are, you know, accretive, that do, uh, you know, have returns. And that just so happens to be increasingly stuff that's good for the planet. Um, if, you, if you take that now to the U.S. for a moment, and you look at the infrastructure bill and the IRA Inflation Reduction Act, how long, do, in, in, under the best scenario, how long do you think it will take until we see a major impact from this legislation? I think you're seeing it now. I mean, you know, anyone who thinks otherwise is probably not really paying attention. Um, I think one of the less discussed things of the IRA, particularly the, the Inflation Reduction Act, is the way that it's fundamentally reconfiguring and reconfigured uh, government you know, fund resource allocations and processes, uh, and will do so probably at on the worst case scenario for probably a generation or more uh, going forward. Uh, now that, that could be problematic for from some bandages, but I think it's actually really important, uh, you know, particularly for things that are, you know, net positive on tackling climate change. And I think it's done that and will continue to do that. Staying a little bit on the, on the political side. So we, we see the political landscape changing fairly radically, depending on how, for example, elections turn out, and very little uh, is, is needed to change from one outcome of the election to another with very different uh, takes on, for example, what climate or the environment uh, should receive in terms of uh, resources. In, in the negotiations, is that actually a, a major factor or is that just balanced by the, by the rest of the people at the table? I think it's a, I think it's a major factor. Um, I, I used to say in uh, 2020, you know, what's the most important thing for the climate system? And I said the U.S. election in 2020, how it came out, because if uh, uh, the Republicans won, there would be very little action on climate change by the U.S. And if the Democrats won, there might be. And there, in fact, has been, as Michael said, with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. 
um, and the re-engagement with Paris, the commitment to reduce emissions by 50% by US emissions by 50% by 2030. So I think, uh, again, uh, who controls the various branches of government in the US makes a big difference. Now, of course, the US is only one country among many. It's only now responsible for about 10% of global emissions. Uh, China is now the, by far the biggest emitter. So it's obviously not just the US, but if the US is disengaged, it gives a lot of other countries that also really don't want to do very much, frankly, a good excuse not to do something. Whereas if the US is engaged, which I think it is now, uh, it makes it harder for them to uh, resist. Uh, if I can just make a couple other comments, I, I think uh, I'm not a huge fan of the multilateral process, having been involved with it 30 years, but I think it's much too simple to blame the multilateral process for the lack of progress in climate change. The fundamental problem is with national governments. National governments, uh, it's their positions that drive how the climate change negotiations go. Uh, so if you don't have big emitters um, pushing for stronger action, or if you in fact have them pushing for weaker action, uh, then you know, no matter what multilateral process you have, you're not going to be able to solve the problem. Um, and right now, um, uh, there are a lot of countries that are quite resistant uh, to pushing for stronger action. At COP27 uh, in Sharm el Sheikh, one of the major issues was not pushing forward. It was preventing rolling back what was agreed to last year in Glasgow. In Glasgow, there was a move from the two degree temperature goal, which was the Paris goal, the primary Paris goal to 1.5, which was more an aspirational goal. And I think one of the big achievements in Glasgow was to sort of move the expectation from the two degree goal to the 1.5 degree goal. Um, in Sharm el Sheikh, there was a big effort to not reference the 1.5 degree goal. And that wasn't by the US or uh, developed countries, that was by big developing countries, which are very worried about the 1.5 degree goal because to achieve that will require huge reductions in their emissions, which they are uh, worried about how it will affect uh, their economies. It's, it's almost safe to say that 1.5 is at this point more than aspirational. It's, it's maybe theoretically still possible, but in, in all likelihood, we, we, we will not uh, reach that. Before we go to uh, question and answers, would like to just get a take from each of you of how you see the overall outcome of COP27 and what do you expect COP28 to bring? So is there a, you know, did COP27 lay a foundation that can be built upon? Did it actually already seed some of the actions that we hope we will see at COP28? And if so, where do you see the major pathways forward. And let's uh, start with uh, Michael and then just move over to Elizabeth. Yeah, I mean, briefly, I think one of the biggest upsides is the sort of call it institutionalization, formalization of uh, sort of advocacy around climate justice uh, and the, the creation of the first climate justice pavilion. Uh, it was the first, you know, in Sharm el Sheikh, but it's been sort of on the margins of discussion for the better part of, you know, 20 years or so. Uh, and that, I think, you know, some of you saw it in the news, will, may tee up, um, it's going to drive certainly discussion, um, you know, a formal process for thinking about uh, various ways to phase out fossil fuels. Uh, I don't think, I don't see you getting a, a sort of a huge uh, agreement on that, uh, but I see possibly uh, an opening in, you know, forcing some parts of the multilateral architecture to do something with fossil fuels, a phase out, whether it's the banking side, uh, whether it's a uh, some of the insurance mega side, uh, I think there's going to be more and more momentum to do that. And that's, that's been being call, been called for for many, many years. Uh, but now we're in a moment where actually the prices are right to do it. Uh, so I think that momentum is going to accelerate going forward. I, I think we may not get progress at 29 or 20, 28 um, in, in Dubai, but probably 29, COP30, um, you'll see that really accelerating. Wait, and From the education perspective, I think things are going to continue to accelerate, which is exciting. Like I mentioned earlier, COP26 was the first time education ministers were invited into the conference. Um, at COP27, we also saw, which I didn't mention, the first climate education coalition established, which was between a number of youth NGOs and individuals that were able to sign and make commitments towards climate education. And they're already actively um, uh, working towards that. The, those goals. Um, there was also the um, Climate um, Education Hub, which was the first education hub dedicated to climate education, which was 
also quite busy and the climate and um, education and youth hub um, was also there. So I think next year in COP28, we're gonna just continue to see um, growth in the education sector. I hope it continues to unpack and help reimagine education because I don't think the way we're progressing with mass schooling is hitting the mark. Well, I think at the moment, really, the most important things going on with climate are not at the COP, they're outside the COP. So, but I think they're driven, as Michael said, partly by the multilateral process. So I think actually one of the most important things coming out of COP27 didn't happen at COP27, it happened at the G20 meeting, which was simultaneous, which was the announcement of a just energy transition partnership with Indonesia, uh, providing $20 billion to Indonesia from developed countries. Uh, to try to decarbonize their economy. Last year, there was a $10 billion joint uh, energy, similar kind of thing, what's called the Jet P now uh, for South Africa. So these are targeted initiatives for particular countries to decarbonize their economies with substantial finance provided for them to do so. So um, similarly, I think uh, uh, the public financial flows uh, that Michael was talking about are really dwarfed by the private flows investments in energy um, uh, by the private sector, which amount to trillions of dollars, not tens or hundreds of billions of dollars. So trying to redirect those, making it more difficult for financial institutions to invest in fossil fuels is key. And one of the biggest announcements from Glasgow last year was that uh, asset managers responsible for $1.4 trillion um, in assets uh, said that they were committing uh, their management towards uh, uh, net zero by 2050. Now, what that means, how they're going to do it, whether they'll implement it, I think there's been backsliding, but that's really important. So I view the COPS actually as not the sort of centerpiece of the action these days. It's more setting the tone. That's why the 1.5 degrees, even if it's impossible to reach, still sets an aspiration that drives stronger action. So whether we actually get to two or whether we at uh, 1.5 or 1.7 or 1.8, you know, having that very strong uh, um, target, I think does in fact then drive stronger action, not so much through the COP process directly, but through the wider uh, processes. So, so more more like a, a trigger for the rest of society. Elizabeth, what, what's your take of looking from afar, but, but also looking from the perspective of what you would like to see? Yeah, of course. Um, kind of tapping off of the concept of a tone switch um, at COP, I think the, the concept coming out of COP27 with the loss and damage fund um, it really does set a tone of, we are starting to discuss that we most likely won't reach that 1.5 degrees Celsius target. So we, and we won't be able to phase out fossil fuels as quickly as we would like to. We won't be able to reduce emissions as we quick, as quickly as we would like to. So we are really needing to focus on adaptation and climate justice now. So really setting the tone moving forwards into how do we adapt? How do we create societies and infrastructure that will remain resilient against climate change, which is why I think the pillar for COP28 education is so important because not even with youth, but at any level, just providing education for climate. So you have an understanding of what it is and how it relates to the work you're doing as it is incredibly intersectional. It's incredibly important because with youth today, these are the future city planners. These are the future architects. These are the future policymakers, these are the future business leaders, these are the people making decisions that will impact the future of climate and as well as the present decision makers and members of society today. So it's really sets a tone for switching towards adaptation and then next year looking at education on how we can really enforce and just create this culture about adapting and staying resilient in light of the climate crisis. Great. Um, just one quick note on adaptation and mitigation. Uh, one thing that came out in the 10 new insights of climate change that uh, is uh, annually released and uh, ASU actually has a big part in that together with the Earth League is that we have to get into our heads that there are limits to adaptation. So while adaptation is necessary, there are also limits to how much we can adapt. Uh, so, but that, that don't want to go deeper into that, just see that into your mind uh, because we do. Um, move towards the end, and I would like to have some questions in, but cannot help before going to Q&A to ask each of you just in one short sentence, or maybe even in just one word, do you think ASU is doing, let me rephrase that, do you think academia, including ASU, is doing enough on the climate change front and on feeding into 
events such as the COP. And I'm starting here on the left now and move the other direction. So Elizabeth. Briefly, no, but we have started. I, I think quite a lot, but I could do more. Academia, no, ASU, I think is on the right track. It has to be more strategic and tactical. So the amount is, I would call it irrelevant. It's gotta be tactical and strategic. Great, thanks. So let's now open to uh, questions from the audience. And uh, I'm not sure if we have microphones. Oh, here, Jason has a microphone. So any, any questions or comments or any thoughts that you have on the discussion or the COP process in general? Yes, it is work. Yes, I have a question about the red panda in the room that Dan referred to. And um, right before COP, there was another very important meeting for the planet. And that was the Congress of Chinese Communist Party. In the report that President Xi presented to the Congress, it unequivocally states, that China will continue to fuel its economic growth with coal and oil. And it emphasized coal. Sustainability as a concept does not appear at all in the report. Climate change appears twice, both in the context of he decrying the West trying to use climate change to constrain China. As you said, Dan, at this moment, China emits more CO2 than the US and the EU combined. Is there room in the context of COP? to engage with China in a dialogue about, you can imagine fueling your growth differently. Because an argument can be made that if China does not effectively decarbonize, many other things that are happening are gonna be irrelevant because their projections are that the CO2 emissions will increase. By the way, there's a lot of discussion about this in China. I mean, a lot of Chinese scholars really were alarmed at President Xi's speech. It was almost a love poem to Ko, which, so what, what room is there? Or does it have to be a dialogue with China that takes place, I don't know, in Th thanks. room somewhere? Thank, thanks, Jose. Dan, do you want to take that? That, that dialogue does take place. Uh, it takes place outside the COPS and it takes place at the COPS, actually at the COPS. Uh, uh, she and uh, President Biden met and uh, announced that they would re-engage on climate and they're actually meetings between uh, Kerry, John Kerry, who's our uh, principal negotiator, and Shia, who's their principal negotiator. So that does take place. Uh, China's actually been in the negotiations relatively helpful. Um, what they're doing at home, of course, is another story. They, they have committed to net zero by 2060. Um, whether they have a, actually a credible pathway to get there, I think, is unclear. So yeah, I, but I totally agree with you. China is key. If China doesn't uh, decarbonize, then uh, doesn't whatever the rest of the world does, uh, there's uh, going to be a huge problem. Other questions or comments? Thank you so much. This was very uh, informative. So as an Egyptian, I was watching closely um, COP because, you know, uh, highlights the, the country. And uh, obviously around COP, there was a lot of talk about human rights issues. Um, I'm sure you were following some of the injustices that are taking place in the country itself, political prisoners, environmental activists like myself in the past that have struggled a lot to try and actually fight against this, this, uh, these kinds of regimes. So I'm curious if within the discussions, negotiations of COP, whether the topics of human rights do take a center stage, and if so, in what ways do they do that? I know you talked about climate justice, but are human rights part of that climate justice uh, discussion? Thank you. Let's do it the following way. From the negotiation point, then maybe you can uh, give a, a, a a short response, and then from the perspective of how did it feel being there, uh, seeing these issues being discussed around the the formal negotiations, um, I, I would like to to ask Anne to give us a, an impression how she felt about that. So, uh, human rights, not in the sense you're talking about, 
treatment of individuals at the, in Egypt at the COP, uh, but just the effect of climate change on the enjoyment of human rights generally, that's getting much, much more attention. Now there have been several uh, decisions by international courts and national courts that are hinge on human rights. And in fact, the Dutch Supreme Court has ordered uh, Netherlands to increase their emission reductions largely on human rights grounds under the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, Vanuatu is going to be announcing in the next week or two um, proposed uh, question for an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on climate change. We don't know what the question is, but it's likely to involve the human right to the environment and the effect of climate change on that. So it is getting much more attention. It's also getting more attention in terms of the effects of actions to combat climate change and how those affect human rights. So monoculture trees, how those affect indigenous rights, for example, uh, converting large amounts of agriculture to um, biofuels, how that affects the right to food. So yes, I'd say there's increasing attention, particularly outside the negotiations, but some degree inside the negotiations as well. And from my perspective, being on the ground and just being at COP, I was not part of any of the negotiation conversations, but um, it seemed that human rights were addressed, but in very guarded ways, um, with certainly within the con confines of, of the COP27. I certainly didn't see anything um, outside of the, the venue that related to anything happening in COP27. Um, I will say the youth are bringing human rights to the forefront in a lot of their discussions. Some of the things they want help with and are asking education to help them with is how to be better activists, how to address these issues um, from their positions as youth, but um, they need skills and they recognize that. I saw um, from youth I know that had been at previous COP and, and moving forward, tremendous growth in their ability to articulate these needs. So I think it's... Um, evolving, but um, it certainly was guarded and it was certainly um, watched from my perspective at COP27. Anything that was occurring was um, done with a lot of um, eyes around them. Let me just add to just this, the issue of uh, inclusion or exclusion. It was interesting how difficult it was to get to this COP in terms of the cost of it. The the cost for flights, the cost for hotels were really high. And anecdotes, I mean, I talked to several people, or several people, you know, mentioned to me that they booked early. They were approached by the hotel, their, their booking was canceled and rebooked at two to three times the price when, when it got closer to the, to the event. That is, of course, not a great sign for an for, for an event like that, that, that is negotiating um, a, a topic that's really so vital for all of humankind, not just for those who can pay the whatever, five, six, seven thousand dollars to fly to, to Egypt, um, which, you know, was, was much higher than, than it usually is. Gary, did you have your hand up before? The, the energy system that we have in the world is the result of security architecture of superpowers that's been dynamically developed, this particular one, since World War II. Because it's proprietor of the security architecture, climate change is a distant second in terms of thinking about the energy system. Was any of that apparent in the negotiations that the way in which the system transforms has to take into account the way in which nations perceive their energy security? And to illustrate what I mean, just look at what's happening as a result of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine and the way nations are scrambling to cover their energy requirements. Do you think that's appreciated? and that that's coming down into the kinds of actions people are proposing taking? So maybe Dan and then uh, Michael could offer their insights into that. Uh, Dan, from the formal negotiation perspective, and, and Michael, you from your perspective of looking at energy system transformation. Uh, well, I don't think it really comes into the, as far as I know, into the negotiations themselves. I, I mean, I think they're is now recognition that actually uh, switching to renewables can increase your energy security because you're producing the energy 
locally. So, um, and as I understand it, uh, the war in Ukraine is, you're much more familiar with this than I am, is getting European countries to rethink uh, how they're getting energy and to try to be producing more um, domestically. But, um, but it doesn't, as far as I know, really enter into the way the negotiations are at a highly abstract level. So there's barely any mention of any particular sector, including energy at all. I mean, I would slightly have a variant on that. I mean, you know, the talk about, you know, the conversation in Sharm El Sheikh around the pathway to end fossil fuels, um, while it was certainly, you know, a flag waved by activists and folks on the margins, it got in the negotiation conversation to some extent because of India. Um, and in fairness, if you paid attention to it, it was a bit of a bait and switch, and I think caught up with some security issues. Um, they were afraid of a target being on coal. Um, so they said, okay, let's have all fossil fuels gone away with. Now, from one vantage, that may not seem to be tied up with security uh, and the point you're making, Gary, but I think it very much is. Um, and I think that's probably a, another panel. <laughs> it's a longer discussion. But I think it also tracks back to the China point. Uh, there are big, obviously, huge problems with Chinese emissions. But on a bad day, they're 10x the renewables of this place uh, on a bad day. Um, so while it looks to some that, oh, they're just going to dial in with the policy paper uh, of the Congress on you know, fossil fuels, the fact is, is that they're also dialing in hugely on renewables. Um, and that is a lot about security. Um, so I think it's absolutely there. We don't see it sort of in the main as much. And you have to sort of read the, the tea leaves. Uh, you know, I think some activists, you know, might have uh, you know, gotten you know, tricked in, you know, rah, rah, India, look, this great country wants to bash fossil fuels. Ha, huh, no, it's really a more subtle security uh, issue. So I think it's absolutely there, but you have to really pay, pay close attention to what countries are saying what, what they're doing, um, you know, independent of their papers, but actually in terms of real infrastructure and so forth. So I think it's very much there. So that brings us to the end of our session. We'd like to thank uh, Michael and Dan and Elizabeth for being with us, for having this, uh, you know, stimulating conversation. And I would like to thank all of you for attending and we'll see you all for the next round of this kind of uh, event on a different topic. Thank you. Thank you.